The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Amen. (laughs) What a privilege to worship the living God. Russell is called home this week and... uh, he is now in the presence of Christ, made perfect. And his widow got up this morning and she has come to worship the living God with us. And so I love that lady's faith. And she says that she's grieving, but joy comes in the morning and God is meeting her in a beautiful way. And so, hallelujah. Where is she? Where'd she go? Love you. Love you, love you. Yeah. And we clap for the faith that God has put in you and the glory that he's getting. Because no human being should be here worshiping the living God this morning. And so we give him glory and praise for what he's done in your heart, Francis. Well, a special welcome to any of our guests who are with us this morning. We're grateful to have you here at Southside Bible Church. Last Sunday, we started fixing our attention and our hearts upon the Advent season, and I really, the, you guys did such a good job this morning on the Advent, I feel like we should rent you guys out, just though the family was cute and everything was about perfect, so that wasn't planned, but hallelujah, I'm going to make some money off this, I'm going to call some places. <laughs> so we are going to begin focusing <laughs> on the coming of Christ into the world by the Incarnation. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to take up the glories and the beauties of of really of John 3.16, that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 2 and look at it from every angle of how God gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so I hope to fix our hope on the blessed hope uh, during this season. Isaiah tells us that the world was lying in darkness, and he said he said, prophesied that a light's going to come and shine upon it. And so in John 1, the light came into the world. The revelation of God came into all the darkness, and he entered in. And Christmas then is God's plan for how to deal what happened in the garden uh, with the serpent and the destruction that came upon humanity and creation. This is God's design to deal with sin and evil and suffering and death and our estrangement from God and to deal with it for good so that we can have an eternal peace. Thus the Prince of Peace entered into the world. And in our day and age, there's just so much darkness The fall has really done great harm to to us individually and to us as a world. The God of this world, Satan, guides and leads this world deeper and deeper into darkness. We live in a land that lies in darkness. And so we need hope. And some of you have even come in here this morning and you just got a little flicker and you're struggling and Christmas season can bring it out and, and make you feel even more lonely and in the battle. And so this morning, I just want to lift you up to, to this light that came into our darkness. I want to take the next three weeks and show you the most glorious reality of what has happened at Christmas. I want to pour gasoline on that little flame in every one of our hearts that that light would dispel the darkness that any of us have. He needs to be received and he needs to be focused on and worshiped and adored. I love closing with come let us adore him. We cannot be taken down by Hallmark or our world or what the church even in some places tells us what this season should be, what this life should be. I want to tell you what God says it should be. I want to take the inspired word of God and open it up and say, what is Christmas? And I want to look at Jesus and the fullness of the time that he came into the world, that he will come again and he will culminate what he inaugurated at his first coming. And we wait and hasten the day as they were doing in Luke chapter one. This morning, we're going to look at Luke chapter two. So if you'll turn there, Luke chapter two, I'm officially over my cold but I'm going to carry a sinus infection for the next couple months. Hallelujah. Do not come hug me afterwards if you're sick. (laughs) Thank you. Let's read it. 
the inspired historical record of the incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 2. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. <clears throat> and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in claws and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end, shall we pray? Oh God, we come to this record that you've given us through your Holy Spirit by the human instrument of Luke. And God, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful explanation of the entrance of your Son into the world. And so I pray now that your Spirit would take these words and you would illuminate them into every mind and heart. God, let none of us keep this external. Let every heart be taken up with the gift that you gave to this world. And so, Lord, come meet all the needs, dispel darkness, loneliness, hurts, depressions. I, I pray let this light shine into every heart here this morning and do what only God can do. Meet all the million different needs. God, with this word this morning, by your Spirit, we pray. Amen. Anything jump out at you as, you, as I read that account? And you don't have to yell an answer or anything like that, but it just anything stand out. The most remarkable thing to me is how unremarkable it is. The simplicity and humility has arrested me since I was a child. They're just such common circumstances. Yet its eternal significance couldn't be greater. And the more I study and learn about this great salvation and watching it unfold throughout history with the prophesying and the picturing and God painting pictures for us and this long expected wait that when the fullness of time has finally come, it takes my breath away with, with the sense of what is before us. You know, does it not? The humblest birth in the history of the world. There, there's no fanfare. There's no room at the inn. The Son of God comes into the world to a very poor couple in a stable, wrapped in swaddling claws, and laid in a manger. Doesn't that just kind of hit you? It's just so anticlimactic. It's surprising. It's not expected. And I, I think I've spent my whole Christian life, and again this week, just why? I just... I'm one of those curious people. Why this way? I, I want to know, God, why would you do it this way? Help me see the beauty and the fullness. And that's what I'm going to attempt to answer this morning from the Word of God, because I think the answer is Christmas. And so as we look at the advent of Christ this morning, your outline, I want to examine three aspects of his birth. We're going to look at the historical setting in verses 1 through 2. And then we're going to look at this personal setting, and then we'll look at the simplistic setting. And so let's take a look at the historical setting in verse 1. <clears throat> now it came about in those days, well, what days are those, Luke? Well, it's the time that we're told Herod was on the throne. Gabriel has come and appeared to Zacharias and Elizabeth and unto Mary, and they can't have children, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and says you're going to have a baby in their old age, and then Mary is never going to know a man, and she's going to be conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit, the Son of God. Those days. John's just been born. Mary's ready to give birth. It was in those days. Look at uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 11. For today, in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That day. So don't miss this. This birth happened in a day in history. So it's not imaginary. This is not a mythological story. It's not in a galaxy far, far away. 
once upon a time. It's not Middle Earth. We, we don't need stories to inspire us. We're a fallen people in darkness. We can't find our way home. We're like sheep and we're lost and we're depraved and we're turned inward. Our nature has curved in on itself and death reigns. So we needed a real savior. We needed God to come into this world to save it, to save us from our sins in real history. And the, the time of Quirinius and Caesar Augustus, the time when they took a census of all the inhabited earth, that time, that day, not a day earlier, not a day later, God's decreed day for his son to enter the world that he created to be the savior of the world. Jesus was born into a real city, in a real place, a real Bethlehem that is still with us today. It's six miles outside of Jerusalem, the home of Jesse, the father of David, the place that Micah told us he would be born eight centuries before. And on this day, a savior from sin was born into this world. A story would do me no good. I need a real savior for my real sin from a real hell that was awaiting me. I needed a savior. People of God on this day, let that take your breath. Christmas is a real fact. I need a savior, not a legend. And he came into this world. And in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census would be taken of all the inhabited earth. I need to settle down or I'll never get through this sermon. <laughs> that is unbelievable. In this day, the decree went out. It was an imperial decree. Caesar made an edict and he went out of Rome and it went from, to Judea. Caesar Augustus. Do you know that's not his name? Caesar means like a king or an emperor. Augustus was an adjective and it means to be esteemed or highly honored. So his first name wasn't Caesar and his last name wasn't Augustus. This decree came from one of Rome's Caesars. And this particular one was born on September 23rd of 63 BC. And his name was Gaius Octavius, known as Octavian. Quick history on him. His mother, Atia, was the daughter of Julia, who was the sister of Julius Caesar. Julius loved Octavius, and he actually adopted him when he was 20 years old. And one year later, Julius Caesar was murdered. Most know that history. Later, Octavian ruled with another Caesar named Mark Anthony. And Mark Anthony left his wife for Cleopatra, who was the queen of Egypt. And his heart became more co concerned with Egypt than Rome. <clears throat> and what followed was this great battle between the two of these men. And in 31 BC, it was a war that was fought on water. Octavius destroyed them, and he became the sole ruler of Rome. And he ruled for 45 years. He extended the Roman Empire greatly from England and to Spain to northern Africa. He built roads for the extension of all of his power. And he may have been the greatest of all the Caesars of Rome. It was said of him that he took Rome over in the dirt and he left it covered in marble. He brought a season of unprecedented peace to the world, Pax Romana. And now you could travel on roads. They were finally safe under his rule before they were too dangerous to travel. And it's kind of a cool providence because now the gospel could spread so freely after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, kind of like the providence of the printing press uh, for the Reformation. So there were many statutes in honor of Augustus. I want to read you one inscription that I came across this week. He's a savior of the common folk. He makes peace for the land. While cities bloom with harmony and good seasons, the productivity of all things is good and at its prime. The king had brought uh, fond hopes and goodwill toward the future for Roman citizens. So it's a very interesting time that day that we're looking at this morning. At this time, Christ entered the world. When the world thought they had an earthly savior, they had peace, hope, and good news for Rome. This was their king who was ruling when the real king of glory entered into this world. 
Peace and glory of Rome became at the cost of blood and war. Peace was secured through war. It was maintained through terror and tyranny and taxation. It was a world full of darkness and idolatry and superstition, and it was the worship of the emperor. And in that context, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, would be born into this world. And it was this context that God would choose to work out his plan and his program. And even this birth, he'll take the wise of this world and he'll show the foolishness and the simplicity of, of this gospel. And he's going to rule through peace and love and this new kingdom that he will inaugurate. Isn't that a beautiful setting for the king of kings? So it's amazing, even as we begin with the contrast of the two rulers in this context, Caesar Augustus, this great earthly king with all submission to him and a palace and all the fanfare and everything that goes with it. And here comes the king of kings and a manger. That's just, why? It's such a contrast. And I think right out of the gate, this kingdom will not be like any earthly kingdom as we know it. It's going to be a completely, everything about the kingdom of God is diametrically opposed to the kingdoms of this world. And so we see it as we begin this morning. So what, what happened? Well, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And all, all the known inhabited earth that was ruled by Rome. <clears throat> and this census was done for two reasons. To enlist people into military duty, which the Jews didn't have to do. But the second purpose was for taxation. And this was the, the first one while Quirinius was governor. The word governor means leader or ruler. So Quirinius is the leader, ruler of that area. And, and so the part I don't get is why do we bring up Quirinius? Well, I think it's to clarify the time, again, of a real historical event. Everyone would have known exactly which census this was. I was told they were taken every 14 years. Oh, it's the census while Quirinius was governor. And so Luke continues to show that this happened in history. This isn't a philosophy of life. It's not a fairy tale or the spirit of Christmas. It's heaven's invasion into history. It's a divine visitation in a real time and in a real place. That has just been arresting me all week. Christ Jesus came into this world on this day. And so the question I have is why would a nine-month pregnant woman in the cold of winter travel 90 to 95 miles? Anyone here pregnant? <laughs> why would you do that? Well, I'm thinking it's kind of like an April 15th. There's a deadline and you got to get there. In verse 3, everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So I imagine there's a deadline that you have to get there by. <clears throat> and so they're all going to go to their own city to register. And so why would Luke spend time on this? <clears throat> Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. And his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. To fulfill God's word, this baby had to be born in Bethlehem. By the decree of a pagan ruler, at the exact time it takes place. If it was a week earlier or later, Jesus wouldn't have been born in Bethlehem. And so to fulfill Micah 5.2 in God's plan and program, it all was moving perfectly. Eight centuries before his birth. And so we're going to look at that on Christmas Eve, and I'm going to try to flush that out because I just, I'm taken up with it right now. So my friends, that is how God is controlling every detail of this world as he unfolds his plan of redemption. God holds all things in his hands and all things for his purposes, even the week that we just faced as a church with some tough providences that came upon us. Augustus is the strongest arm in history, and it moves perfectly for the strongest arm in the universe like nothing. All I could think of is Proverbs 21.1, the, the Lord holds the, the, the king's heart and turns it wherever he wishes. And so here's the, the ruling power of the day, and God just turns it wherever he wishes to have this decree. This whole account reminds me a little bit of Esther. Kings and rulers and evil and righteous people and plots and Haman and the Jews. And, and, and as you read that book, the one name that's not mentioned in Esther is God. 
<laughs> but his hand is working out every detail and moving history to the day that we're studying this morning for the internal kingdom that he's ushering in and keeping the Jews alive in that time. And so Luke 2, 1 through 7, the same way the name of God isn't mentioned in 2 verses 1 through 7. Just some facts that are recorded. A simple executive order of a very normal event in history of Augustus with taxation. So the decree is not optional. They must go, and they must go to their own city to register their ancestry registration. And so Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. And it just so happens that God said this 600 years that earlier it would happen. And Luke doesn't even refer to the promise. He doesn't even say it. Have you ever seen that show? Uh, most of you are old enough, but just the facts, ma'am. And, and so here it is, is just the bare facts. You get nothing else. You're not, he's not even saying this is fulfilling prophecy. This is something to not glance over simply. Who was ruling in the days of Caesar Augustus? And who was ruling in the days of Donald Trump? Who is the real ruler? Let your hearts be at peace. We live in such a fretting age with authorities and governments and CNN and all these things of just anxiety. The king of kings is on the throne. It is this world that God is working out his plan of redemption and he wants us to rest like the little baby on Mary's lap. The world is a mess with messy men and women governing it and they're governing messy men and women. We live under the sovereign hand of God whose ways cannot be frustrated. So that's just a little side note. Be of good cheer this morning. Second, so our first point, that's the historical setting. What I want to look quickly then is I just want to show you the personal setting of this context. Look at verse 4. So they, they, they each go to their own city. And in verse 4, Joseph went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. So Joseph is obedient. He takes his nine-month pregnant wife, saddles a donkey, and he begins the trek of 90 miles to Bethlehem on a donkey. And so Joseph and Mary, they're, they're, they're just submitting to their ruling authorities of the day. And they have to brave this long, difficult journey. And that is all that they can see from their perspective. And the whole thing is just the purpose of taxation. And so if we could enter into their personal setting, what what a difficult providence at, at a very difficult time in their lives. I know women who won't go 10 miles from the hospital when they're this close to delivering. They're going to take the trek. And one more beautiful promise to not miss is the seed that was promised from David that would sit on a throne and his kingdom would have no end. And in Luke 1, it was saying, here's the fulfillment of that. And our text shows that Joseph was from Bethlehem, from the city of David, and he's going there now to register who David was a thousand years earlier. And so this seed named Jesus of Nazareth uh, will be born in the city of David, and he's now going to take over that throne and his kingdom. And so we will look in greater detail on, on Christmas Eve at that. So your historical setting, your personal setting with Joseph and Mary, and the whole reason I wanted to look at this this morning is I just want to look at the simplistic setting of this, if you will, in verse 6. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. And so again, here's the brevity and the simplicity. Here are the humble beginnings on earth of the Son of God. The greatest birth into poverty and rejection and non-recognition. If, if you would have been there, you would have saw nothing unusual. Believe it or not, there was no halo. There was no royal garments, no angels floating, and there wasn't even an organ playing in the background. The the cattle maybe were lowing, but that could be about it. And if you would have walked by, you would have smelt uh, dung and urine and animals with a baby crying in its midst. It says there was no room for them at the inn. With the census going on, they had no place to stay. And so there there was hotels had like a parking lot where the animals would be parked in a stable. 
And so there were these stables and and so the, the worn out couple can't find a place and they go and they give them a stable. And there Mary gives birth to her firstborn son and, and she, she wraps him in swaddling clothes. Is there any significance to that? Uh, yes, she was a good mother. You know, to, to wrap, uh, I've seen, uh, Mari and Jeff had their little baby and they, they wrap it up like a little burrito. You know, in this blanket and, and you look at it and the baby's so happy and that's all it is, just a good mother wrapping up the baby in swaddling clothes for the comfort and, and just being a good mom was all that was. And she wrapped him up and laid him in a manger, which was a feeding trough for the animals. And so the Lord of glory is now born into a beast's bull. And this would just become the pattern of his life. In Luke 9, Jesus said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He, he, he will just continue in rejection and poverty. In John 1, it says, the one who created all things, he came to his own. They've been waiting thousands of years for this, and his own didn't receive him. His own had no place for Christ. And I tell you that if Octavian would have come to Bethlehem, you would have had all the pomp and circumstance, parades. But here there's not even a ripple on earth to show the infinite plunge of Christ. He, he left glory to a donkey's dish. And now he lays in a manger. And he's going to end his stay on earth hanging on a criminal's tree. The life of the Son of God bookended. And when I consider the significance of what just happened in this manger, all of history has been moving to this promise. And the rest of history is going to be defined by this promise following his death. And when I think of what was being said in Luke 1, they're, they're making prophecies. This is what was promised to Abraham. This is what was promised to David. And they're, they're being overwhelmed saying, here it is. Here's the fulfillment of all of our history. He's come. All of a sudden, this setting just seems so out of place. Because next week, we're going to look at chapter 2, verse 8 and following. And the, the shepherds, the angels are going to come and interpret what this birth was. So you, you've got these magnificent promises being fulfilled and then being told by the angels and seeing God's glory. And then this little scene with a manger, it just, it's so out of place. So God help us. It's so unsettling and awesome all rolled into one, isn't it? So why did he come like this? Well, just one observation. God's salvation is not so high that his arm is too short to save. God will go this low so that you can reach and feed upon the Son of God. What does Bethlehem mean? The heaven's bread, the manna from heaven. So it's low enough that we could come and feed upon Christ and have eternal life and never hunger again. That you can find grace in your time of need. And so do you see how low divine mercy will stoop? It comes so low, even into a manger, so that the lowly and the downcast and downtrodden, he's saying, come. Christ stooped infinitely out of the precincts of heaven, his eternal glory. He assumed our nature into a virgin's womb. He was birthed, dependent upon a virgin for sustenance and strength. The father would put him in this place. And if it seems like he could steep, stoop no lower, he did. He went to a manger and then he, he ends on a shameful death on a cross. He became obedient to, to the point of death on a cross. A cross is out of place for the Son of God. But the fact is, he's in our place. I want you to hear that if you've walked in here and you've never heard this before. He came to be in our place. Our ruined world and depraved, destroyed hearts. He came in and he assumed our nature to take our place. The place of our judgment upon a cross for sin. He's in a manger for us. He's, upon a, he's hanging on a cross for us. He's in our place. Our sins, our judgment for us. That's the gift of God. Therefore, he who was rich in heaven with all of his glory became poor and he enters into a manger so that you who are poor and destitute and broken in sin can become rich by having all that is in Christ Jesus. That's Christmas. That's what he came and did. 
He, he's just, he's out of place to put us in the right place with God. Christ has taken the lowest place. So he must be given the highest place in our hearts and trust and commitment. May he be given the right place in your hearts this morning. That is what God's gift to us that Christmas morning should bring. God's kingdom is not like this world. I pray you see that. They love Augustus Caesars and all the pomp and circumstance, but God's kingdom is a king like this who has all authority and humility. He used all of his power and authority to empty himself to come and die on a sinner's tree. And he starts a kingdom that's characterized by humility and true love. We're, this is so different from the world, and so we're to be so different from the world. Just the attribute of humility and true love are the people that fill his kingdom. And entrance to this kingdom is not by your, your birth, your merit, or offering. But it's to come with empty hands, with nothing to cling simply to thy cross. To to have nothing but our sweet Christ. This is the most beautiful and amazing kingdom with a king who I only grow and love with the more I discover of who he is and he rules in perfect righteousness. So I want to close with trying to answer that question one last time. Why? Why did he come so weak? The whole world lies in darkness. Why did he not come and just change this darkness? The world is as dark as it's ever been. Why why didn't he do something about that like it was promised and prophesied? Why was he subjected to the darkness? Why did he not come as promised a conquering king? The answer is quite simple. (laughs) And you have to get this. If Christ came to destroy evil this time, what we're reading about this morning, you wouldn't be left. Nobody would have been left. If he came to destroy evil, everybody dies. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not even one. The evil is not out there. It's in my own heart. I'm evil. If God came and destroyed evil, I was finished. I want you to hear that this morning. He came to be rejected, not accepted by this world and rule it. You can see his entrance. He didn't come for fanfare. He didn't come to bring judgment this time. He came to bear it. He came to bear the judgment of God. That's why he entered this world the first time. So now he can return and end all the effects of the serpent's bite in the garden and deception. And all the evil that has come forth from that day without ending us. To gather a people for himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now he can come again and gather his people. So the darkness is in your heart. You can't save yourself. A little religion isn't going to fix it. A little morality can't help it. Jesus didn't come to give you a good example to follow. He's not an encouraging story, so you'll keep fighting. He came to save your soul. Named Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. And so he didn't come to be a good example. He came to die on a tree in our place for what we deserve, bearing the justice of God. God became human. He became weak and killable. And he went up on a cross willfully. I want you to hear that willfully. In our place. He died in our place. He was buried in our place. And he rose in our place. And he conquered death and sin. By his wounds, we are healed. He came to a manger. And he was rejected and ignored. And later he's going to go to a cross. And they're going to kill him. 
because his light ex- revealed the truth and exposed their hearts and men love the darkness rather than the light and they're going to kill him. And Mary just takes that little baby and wraps him in cloths. And later Joseph of Arimathea is going to wrap him in a linen garment for his burial. He would be rejected by the world and in the end he would be rejected by his father as he hung on that cross and said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Guys, he came this way to be rejected so that you could be accepted by God. He had no room at the inn so we could dwell in his house forever. That's the beauty of the gospel. And I love it so. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, that's how you enter into this kingdom. You come humble, looking at your sin and finally saying, there's nothing in me that can fix this. I'm done looking to my merit, my self-worth, what I can accomplish. I'm done. And I come only to this Christ who's done it all. And I look and call upon Him and believe upon Him and I'll be saved. Come humble. Don't look to your hands. Don't look to religion. Don't look to your parents' faith. (laughs) Come humble to this Christ. And believer, humility, Humility. This isn't about you fighting for your own things and your own rights, not getting recognized. And This is about people who enter this kingdom like they're king and we're a humble people. And all it's about is our, our king. I must decrease, he must increase. So his citizens are just taken up with him and we're a humble people who love. And I pray this Christmas season for every believer in this place that it would overwhelm our hearts again. If this is how our king enters the world, that's where it begins and ends with me too. Humility. This is the gate of salvation. This is the manger in Bethlehem. He didn't set it so high so that no one could come in. But he set it as low as a manger so that the sinners and the unclean and the defiled, and the broken, and the lonely can enter into this kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? It's not for the wise, mighty, or noble. but It's for the the humble of this world. And I pray that uh, we would treasure this beautiful uh, entrance of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you for this beautiful entrance. I thank you for what it proclaims and what it preaches. I pray that no one here this morning would stay away as next week we're going to look and you're going to say, don't be afraid. Draw near to this Christ and your sin. Come and look to him and him alone and be cleansed and forgiven and clothed in a righteous garment and accepted and adopted and brought into the family of God. Lord, I pray for any here who think I've got to stay away because of who I am or what I've done. God, let them see the freedom in this manger this morning to come to the one who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest for your souls, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. God, let them have confidence to, to come to Christ this morning, who's opened his arms. Please come, come. I've come in a manger. Be, be safe. Come and look only to me, and drop all of your deadly doing down, down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Stand in him and him alone complete. Oh God, I pray for every, every believing heart in this room. Lord, let this humble us and let this make Jesus all the more beautiful to us. What a pearl. And I pray, God, just shine. Shine him. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.